Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today is uh, Thursday, February 15th, 2022. This is the Senate Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, we have uh, on our agenda uh, three bills and a uh, presentation on the governor's supplemental budget bill uh, this afternoon. Uh, before we get uh, get started, uh, Mr. Woolworth, if you would take the roll, please. Chair Newman. Present. Vice Chair Jasinski. Here. Senator Dibble. Senator Carlson. Senator Coleman. Here. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Johnson Stewart. Present. Senator Kent. Here. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator McEwen. Here. Senator Osmick. Here. Senator Pratt. Here. Thank you. There, uh, there is a quorum present. And uh, I do notice that we have Senator uh, Jasinski with us uh, for the first time in the Transportation Committee. Senator Jasinski, uh, welcome to the committee. Good to have you back. Uh, any comments that you want to make to your fellow members? Maybe I took him by surprise. Okay, we are going to move on. Uh, the sorry, first did you need me? I'm sorry. I missed that. Is that you, you Senator Jasinski? This is Senator Jasinski, yes. There we go. I just <laughs> wanted to give you an opportunity to say hi to your fellow members. Oh, thank you, everyone. Uh, sorry about the technology. Uh, working to get back in the Senate. Uh, every day is getting stronger and stronger, so I look forward to being back in the Senate building and participating in hearings in person. So thanks again, Scott, for letting me uh, talk to the committee. Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, the first bill that we have up on the agenda is Senator Duckworth's bill, uh, 3137. And I would indicate before we get started that uh, all of the bills uh, that we are going to hear today will be, in fact, uh, laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, so let's begin then with uh, Senate file 3137. Senator Duckworth, welcome to the committee and uh, uh, to your bill. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. It's an honor to be here in person. Uh, to uh, uh, flip the switch. I, I don't. Am I okay? Okay. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate it. It's an honor to be here in person. Uh, this bill is pretty straightforward. Um, at uh, rest stops throughout the state of Minnesota, there are some things that are allowed and some things that are prohibited. This bill allows for an exception that would allow electric vehicle charging stations to be installed operated and maintained in uh, safety rest areas by third parties or private entities. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward bill. Mr. Chair, happy to take questions. I also do have uh, someone here that can provide some expert testimony as well. Mr. Rudine. Thank you, Senator Duckworth and uh, uh, Mr. Rudine, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, nice to see, have you here. Uh, and I believe, Mr. Rudine, this is an agency bill, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Thank you. If you would introduce yourself for the record and please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Rudin with MnDOT Government Affairs. And uh, thank you, Senator Duckworth, for carrying this bill for us. <clears throat> uh, we know that uh, electric vehicles um, emit far less tailpipe emissions uh, than uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. Uh, on average, about uh, 0.88 metric tons per year uh, versus 3.74 metric tons for a gasoline-powered vehicle. Uh, since the year uh, 2018 in Minnesota, electric vehicle registration has increased about 21%. In 2018, we had just under 6,000 electric vehicles registered, and in 2021, we were over 19,000. So uh, still a, a small portion of the overall vehicle fleet, but uh, has been growing rapidly. Uh, there are um, approximately 1,200 uh, charging stations located in the state of Minnesota currently, but we know that there are gaps in the system. 
Uh, a lot of those are concentrated in the metro area uh, as well as um, more heavily uh, traveled corridors around the state. And so uh, we're hopeful that this bill will help us address some of those gaps in the system. Uh, we worked with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, to set a goal of having 20% of light duty vehicles uh, as being electric by the year 2030. And uh, we're coordinating regionally with Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and the state of Wisconsin on uh, establishing electric vehicle uh, corridors uh, throughout the upper Midwest. Currently in Minnesota, the I-35 corridor between Duluth and Bloomington uh, is already considered uh, an alternative fuel corridor. Uh, the I-35 corridor from Bloomington to the Iowa border is, is pending. I-94 between Moorhead and Alexandria, as well as from St. Cloud to the Wisconsin border are currently uh, designated as alternative fuel corridors. And uh, the portion from Alexandria to St. Cloud is pending. Uh, there is no portion of I-90 that is currently uh, designated as an alternative fuel corridor. Just last week, the Federal Highway Administration released uh, some guidance on the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. This is a new formula program uh, that was included in the uh, Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, and this guidance uh, stipulates that chargers using these funds uh, must be located on an alternative fuel corridor. And so uh, that means that really uh, the interstates are supposed to be the first area of focus. And once uh, that system is built out, uh, states can, can use the funds uh, for any uh, location on a public road or a location open to the general public. Uh, we also have to develop a, a plan uh, to, to use these federal funds, uh, and that is due by August of this year. So uh, by spring, actually, hopefully by May, we're intending to identify uh, the remaining uh, segments of interstate in Minnesota uh, and apply for um, designations so that they will be listed as an alternative fuel corridor. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, as you know, there are rest areas located um, along the interstate system uh, as well as uh, non-interstates in Minnesota. Uh, so this legislation will allow us to work with the private sector. Uh, MnDOT is not interested in, in owning and operating these EV charging stations. We feel that's an appropriate private sector role. But in some cases, it might be appropriate to locate those facilities at a rest area. And so this legislation will allow us to work with the private sector. Uh, they would then charge a fee to cover their expenses and, um, and uh, that's what the bill envisions. So Mr. Chair, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Redeen. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Redeen? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two questions. One, when you talk about the amount of um, CO2 and so on when you're comparing the vehicles, do you include the point source of the electricity when you measure that? In other words, is electricity coming from renewables or is electricity coming from natural gas or coal? Do you include that in your comparison? Mr. Reedy. Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, yes, that is included. And, and so the figure that I cited is for the average uh, grid mix in Minnesota currently. If, if you're using a renewable resource, then that would further reduce um, those emissions. One more question. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, the other question is you mentioned a little bit about a fee that was touching on, and maybe there was more detail there. Uh, installed, operated, and maintained. So is that via a charge to those who are using those uh, charging stations? Is it a flat fee are you looking at or all of that? So how does all that infrastructure get paid for as well? Mr. Rudine. Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, yes, the, um, the, the person who, or the company who installs the charging station would, would charge a fee. And so I, I'm not sure I can say for certain whether it would be a flat fee or, or how they would uh, structure 
the rate that they would charge, but it would be presumably a market uh, priced fee to cover their, their costs and, and to uh, turn a small profit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's good for now. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Redeen, on the charging stations themselves, um, the ones we have now and the ones that perhaps are planned, are we charging a surcharge at all? We're charging, I assume we're charging for the juice that people may use to charge their cars, but are we charging a surcharge which would be able to be some, an additional charge to be able to help fund back the cost of these particular pieces of equipment going in? Mr. Rudy. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Osmick, <clears throat> so the MnDOT is not currently operating any of these facilities, and so I, I, I would have to check and see. I would assume that the, the companies who are uh, installing and operating them would have calculated that into the fee that they're charging, but I can try to verify that and get just more information. Senator, uh, no. Senator Carlson. Ooh, trouble getting unmuted here. There you go. We can hear you fine. Go okay. ahead. Um, uh, you have in the bill, it, it talks about uh, that you can have uh, charging stations installed, but I'm wondering if, there, if there's some uh, missing words there. Does that allow us to have commercial companies? Does that allow us to have for-profit companies being able to install these? It seems to me that uh, I, I support this, and I would like to make sure that it, there's a lot of incentive to uh, put charging stations in these rest stops. And I'm, I'm wondering if the description that we have in the bill is um, inclusive enough such that it can be an incentive for somebody to uh, come and put in charging stations and charge, charge power, uh, charge a profit for that power that is being used, delivered and used. Am I, am I correct in that, that we have an, a sufficient description there in that bill to allow that? Mr. Rudy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Carlson, um, I think in our opinion it is sufficient. I, you know, we've, we've had our staff uh, review the language and, and, and they feel that it is sufficient. I, you know, I think um, it, the incentive might be uh, something that we would work with potentially those federal IIJA funds to provide that incentive. So the, the legislation is really just to eliminate the current prohibition that would uh, prevent these charging stations from being located at rest areas. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson. Uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just uh, two quick questions. One to follow up on, on Senator Osmick's question. So. I noticed that this is lumped in with advertising signs, vending machines. Does MnDOT currently charge like some sort of lease uh, agreement to these folks for utilizing that space? I'm, I'm presuming there is some, re I think what we're trying to understand is there is some revenue coming back to MnDOT in some way or form, right? Mr. Reddy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, for, for the uh, advertising signs, uh, these are like the large blue signs you see on the freeway that advertise McDonald's or a gas station. There is a fee um, charged to the business for that. The, the fee is intended to cover the cost of operating the program. Um, as far as vending machines, I, I, I'm not sure. I know that the, the vending machines at rest areas are operated, uh, I think, by the state services for the blind and benefit that program. And so I'm not sure if they um, cover or pay us to, to have those there or if there's some other agreement. I, I would need to check on that. Senator Pratt. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, and as a new member of the committee, maybe this was a, a new term that I wasn't familiar with. Can you tell me what an alternative fuel corridor is? Mr. Riddy. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, that, that's a federal designation, and so um, uh, my understanding is that it's a corridor, if you were traveling in an electric vehicle, you would have assurance that, that there are charging stations located, uh, that there are enough charging stations located along the corridor that you could uh, confidently travel and know that there are places to, to pull over and charge your vehicle. 
uh, they can, in this case, they could be located at a rest area, but um, they could also be at a commercial establishment that has to be within one mile of the corridor. And so there's a process that we go through uh, with the Federal Highway Administration to kind of uh, point out the locations and, and then they basically sign off that this is a corridor that, um, that meets those criteria. And then uh, typically we would put up a small sign. You may have seen some of these signs actually out there. There's, there's a few of them. Um, that indicate that that these are alternative fuel corridors, and it's really just to to uh, demonstrate to people that you know they can safely travel from here to uh, St. Cloud, for example, and and uh, have confidence that if they have an electric vehicle, there would be enough locations to to charge that vehicle. Thank you, Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Redeen. So an alternative <coughs> fuel corridor, does that also, is that just for electric vehicles or does it also involve CNG and LNG and propane and those other alternative fuels that we've had in the past? Mr. Riddy. Uh Mr. Chair and Sir Howe, that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to need to check on that. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't actually look into that since the bill is really uh, focused on the EV uh, charging, but I know that there are other alternative uh, fuels out there, as you've pointed out, and um, I, I'm not aware that there are um, locations to, to publicly, you know, fuel those other types of vehicles uh, on these corridors. I think it is primarily focused on electric vehicles, but but I can check on that and get you some more details. Okay. Any other members have uh, any questions? I am not seeing any hands up. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I think of charging of electric vehicles, there's usually a significant amount of time to do that. And so if they're going to have a power charging where you really have a high voltage situation, that means you really need a strong transmission, uh, a lot of power, a lot of energy. Otherwise, you may have one vehicle but the amount of time you're sitting at that rest station, uh, such as plugging it in overnight, you know, at your car, but in these rest areas, you're not staying there overnight. This is a take a rest and on your way. So usually charging an electric vehicle takes quite a bit of time. I don't quite see how that's going to fit in kind of the design of our rest areas where they say no overnight parking and... Uh, Things like that. So, or or is it anticipation that they're going to do the high voltage type of charging station, and then how do they do that? Because are there just normal transmission lines along the way here to just install that? Mr. Redeen, uh, Mr. Chair, and Senator Kiffmeyer, that uh, I think we would envision what they call a fast charging station, and so it wouldn't be the type of station you know where you would have at say a person's house that would. Uh, be uh, more of an eight-hour charge, but these these can be, um, you know, something that might be an hour or or two. Um, so you know, presumably somebody would would plan to spend some time at the rest area, have a picnic lunch or something while their vehicle was recharging. Um, as far as the the electrical facilities, uh, you know, I think um, in some cases. Perhaps there might be upgrades available, but I think in general the, the services that would already be provided at the rest area would, would probably be sufficient to, to install these types of facilities. Well, Mr. Chair, I think the most important Sorry, thing is my... that the users pay for this and that the taxpayers aren't in another situation of subsidizing somebody else's energy use while they're paying for their own energy use in a different choice in a car. So. Um, concern I have here is what what is who's going to bear the cost of the infrastructure, the transmission of the electricity. There's a variety of other things that go into this that currently right now we have gas stations. We have other ways where people can charge up. So that's a concern uh, part that I have here. Thank you. I am just pausing to see if anybody else has any questions. Sometimes it's hard to spot the hands up on the on the screen. So uh, we have no further questions. Uh, Senator Duckworth, any final comments regarding your bill? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Senator Duckworth. With that, Senate File 3137 is laid over. Next bill on the list is Senate File 3148. That is Senator Pratt's bill. This is also an agency bill. Um, and I believe Mr. Radin is going to remain at the table for us. Uh, Senator Pratt, Senate File 3148 to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before we get into the bill, I'd like to offer the A22 amendment. And Senator Pratt, is that a, uh, a uh, delete all? Or I'm sorry, is that a, an author's amendment? It is an author's amendment, which is a delete all in order to put it into the same form that it is in the other body. Uh, I'm going to ask Senate Council to explain the, uh, the delete all author's amendment. It's really quite simple. Uh, 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 if you would proceed, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify that the amendments, actually the A22-0312, um, it's a reviser number, so the numbering's a little different. All of their amendments start with A22, so for the record, just to make sure we're, we know which one we're offering. Um, and I think the amendment is substantively similar to what's in your packet. There was a snafu at the revisor's office and we needed to do this DE to make sure everything lines up with how it should. Is that, I think that, that's my understanding of the situation. This being an author's amendment, uh, uh, Senator Pratt, do you have a motion? Uh, I, Mr. Chair, I move the A22-0312 as explained by Ms. Uh, Ms. Stengel. And uh, uh, all those in favor of uh, the A, what, what number is it? A, A22 0312. All those in favor of that, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Pratt, to your bill as amended. Thank you. Mr. Chair, the uh, uh, Senate file 3148 is effectively a, a a conglomeration of, of several policies being requested by the agency, and I would just ask Mr. Rudine, I think he would be best to explain it. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Mr. Rudine, please, uh, there's a new bill, so please identify yourself again and proceed. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs. Uh, I'll just run through the bill uh, briefly. Section 1 designates a North Star bark Bikeway from uh, St. Paul to Canada. Uh, this bikeway currently exists already as U.S. Bicycle Route uh, 41, uh, but uh, the working with the bicycle community, the advocates felt it, it needed a more interesting name than Route 41, so they came up with the, the North Star Bikeway. Section 2 of the bill uh, creates a new legislative route, and uh, this is part of a, a situation uh, near Granite Falls where a portion of Trunk Highway 67 has actually collapsed. Um, into the uh, Minnesota River Valley. And so uh, there's a, going to be a reroute of Trunk Highway 67. Uh, and so creating this legislative route facilitates that process. It will still be uh, referred to as Highway 67, but uh, this is the new legislative route number that is being created. Section three allows the department to uh, uh, provide an Indian employment preference for projects on or near uh, a reservation. This proposal has been around uh, for a few years now, so you, you may remember it. I think um, we've talked uh, in previous years about a specific mileage limitation. Uh, the, the current language refers to uh, a distance that could be reasonably expected to commute to and from each workday. Uh, we would be open to, to including a specific mileage limitation uh, if that is the legislature's desire. Section four. Uh, and actually, there's a couple sections here. Uh, sections four and five relate to uh, the money needs that are collected by uh, cities and counties uh, from the state aid system. And uh, there are rare instances where uh, a county road might go slightly outside the county's boundary or same thing for a city. 
And so uh, currently they're not allowed to collect money needs on those portions of roadway. This change, these uh, changes in four and five would allow them to collect those money needs on, on their uh, state aid system. Section six of the bill uh, clarifies that the municipal state aid screening board will have uh, two members. And actually this is the way the screening board has been operating uh, for many years. But in 1989, uh, the two MnDOT districts, there was an East Metro district and, and a West Metro district, those districts combined into one district. And at that time, uh, this change was missed. And so uh, this is a case where the law is sort of catching up with what has been uh, the practice uh, going back to 1989. Uh, sections seven and eight of the bill uh, clarify some provisions that were just enacted uh, last year related to drones and uh, clarifying the definition of a drone and, and the insurance requirements and the ideas here is that uh, people operating drones for recreational purposes uh, do not need to register them or uh, provide insurance. Um, there, under the old law, you, you would have to have insurance for the full year for operating a drone. Uh, this allows people to buy uh, one-time insurance. So if you're a wedding photographer and you want to buy insurance just for one Saturday in May, uh, you're allowed to do that rather than uh, having insurance for the entire year. Uh, section 9 of the bill uh, deletes uh, legislation. Uh, deletes legislative route 274. Uh, this again is, is part of that reroute of trunk highway 67 near Granite Falls that I was uh, describing earlier. And then finally section 10 deletes uh, legislative route 301 in the city of St. Cloud. Uh, and this is a small segment uh, that uh, services the, the state prison in St. Cloud. And so we've um, worked with Department of Corrections in the city to um, develop a project that will be undertaken before this roadway is turned back uh, to the city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Redeen. Uh, we have no other. We have no other testifiers on this bill. Uh, members, any questions? I am not seeing any questions from members. Um, uh, Senator Pratt, any further comments on the bill before we lay it over? No, Mr. Chair. With that, Senate File 3148, as amended, uh, is laid over. Next bill on the uh, agenda is Senate File 3123. Next bill on the agenda is Senate File 3123, Senator Newman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Senate File 3123 is uh, uh, also a, uh, an agency bill from MnDOT. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, the Corridors of Commerce program, which is the subject of this bill, is a, is a very important uh, program within MnDOT. And it's really designed to try and help link different areas or regions of the uh, state together for transportation purposes. Uh, a, a number of years ago, there was some controversy, uh, 2017 to be specific. Uh, and historically, there had been an attempt by uh, the legislature and MnDOT to provide about 50% of the funds to the metro area and 50% of the funds to outstate Minnesota. 2017, uh, technically that happened, but in reality, uh, all of the uh, quarters of commerce funds were spent in the same geographic area of Minnesota where uh, an outstate area was contiguous to the metro area. That caused a, a fair amount of uh, consternation and since that time, there have been several attempts to try and uh, 
address that problem and, and maybe make the program a little bit better. And so uh, Senate File 3123 uh, is uh, MnDOT's current effort to, to dis, uh, address uh, that problem that I've just described. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we could have uh, Mr. Redeem uh, walk through the bill. Mr. Redeem, please state your name for the record. Proceed, proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Redeem with MnDOT Government Affairs. And uh, Senator Newman did a good job. I'll, I'll provide just a little more uh, history, if that's all right. Um, the, the program was originally established in 2013, uh, and in that first uh, solicitation, we had 174 projects that were submitted. Uh, MnDOT did a pre-screening of the list and, and narrowed that down to thir 34 projects for full consideration. Then in 2016, uh, at the legislature's direction, the legislative auditor uh, reviewed the program and uh, pointed out that uh, you know there was no provision in the law for MnDOT to sort of pre-screen projects. And so the one of the changes that was enacted in uh, 2017 was that MnDOT had to evaluate and score all of the projects uh, that were submitted. So then uh, we did another solicitation. There were 173 projects. And uh, it took a, a significant amount of time and effort to, to rate all of those projects. And so part of the proposal here is um, asking the area transportation partnerships to help narrow down uh, the number of projects that are submitted so that, that we're uh, screening uh, a smaller number of projects. And as Senator Newman mentioned also, the, the question of geographic balance uh, was also quite controversial after those changes that were enacted in, in, uh, uh, as a result of the legislative audit. And so we're looking for some guidance um, from the legislature about what geographic balance should mean. Uh, there is, as you see, a proposal in the bill, but if the legislature has a, a, different, a different approach to, to that, we're certainly open to that. We would just like something in the statute to provide uh, that balance. There was uh, last year in, in the budget bill, 200 million in trunk highway bonds for a new uh, quarters of commerce solicitation. <clears throat> and uh, that had a bit of a delayed effective date. We, we don't have to actually uh, start the solicitation projects or solicitation process until this August. And the theory was that this would give uh, time for the 22 legislature to come in and make some modifications before we begin that process. Um, so uh, we, we have spent the last uh, several months actually going around the state uh, to speak with area transportation partnerships and get their input. Uh, and so that's uh, what you see in the bill as a result of that process, where each ATP will be asked to select up to three projects to recommend uh, for the, to advance to the full scoring phase. Uh, how they determine which three projects would really be up to each individual ATP to make that decision. Uh, in the metro area, uh, the, the uh, Met Council would serve that purpose. Um, and we've actually gotten some input from the Met Council about referring directly to the council itself rather than the Transportation Advisory Board uh, to perform that process. Um, the MnDOT Metro District also includes Chisago County, and so their county board would, uh, would put forth a project of their own to be uh, considered. So that would give us a, a maximum of 32 projects that would go through the full scoring uh, process if, if this proposal is enacted. That would be 21 from Greater Minnesota and 11 from the um, MnDOT Metro District. Uh, so, um, because uh, of some of the controversy from the solicitation uh, Senator Newman referred to, we're also suggesting the creation of a small projects category for Greater Minnesota. Uh, and that's because uh, metro area projects and those projects that are nearer to the metro area have higher traffic volumes, typically have a higher number of crashes and congestion delays. And as a result, those projects tend to score higher than uh, a truly rural project would. And so to help uh, create a better balance within the program, uh, we're proposing the creation of a small projects category for projects under $10 million in greater Minnesota. And so uh, 
under the proposal, half the funds would, would be spent in MnDOT's metro district, 25% uh, in greater Minnesota for uh, larger projects over 10 million, and then 25% for uh, smaller projects under 10 million. So that's uh, a brief description of the proposal. We're very hopeful that uh, we do get some additional guidance from the legislature this year before we undertake another uh, solicitation for that $200 million that is currently authorized for the program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Questions for members? Senator Kipmeyer. Thank you very much. I, I think there are some ideas here that I think would assist and especially the small projects and I think the balance we have in rural Minnesota and those kinds of areas those projects are less expensive but they are very very meaningful to their communities and do facilitate the corridors of commerce which this is about it's about connecting corridors of commerce it's not just another road project it's about corridors of commerce, and that's why it was created, and that was in its reason, intent, and purpose for doing that. But I think the idea of separating out small projects is um, very valuable, because often that is the case. that lets them compete on that kind of a basis. I think that has some things. Question for me, though, we usually hear of the seven-county metro area. Here I see eight counties. Um, so what counties would that be? Mr. Redeen? Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, that would be the traditional seven counties plus Chisago County. And uh, the reason for that is that Chisago County is included in MnDOT's metropolitan district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if the legislature preferred to just limit it to the seven counties and then have Chisago County be considered part of greater Minnesota, we would, we would have no problem with that. But, um, we, we did it this way because simply because Chisago County mm -hmm. is part of our metro area district. Senator Kiffmar? Yeah, I think one of the challenges you run into, again, is in the metro area, is the projects by their very nature, as you said, tend to be just more expensive in general. But on the other hand, they have other areas of funding and a variety of other things that sometimes rural Minnesota does not have. Um, nevertheless, I appreciate that information and I would say the small projects uh, probably I think can ease a lot of the angst and again in that particular one um, both Interstate 94 and Highway 169 you know it's a four mile stretch with four stoplights how do you break it up I was a big fan and we did try and break it up into smaller pieces so that you could do just this one or that and do it but extreme amount of disruption to the traffic, both local and those heavy, heavy traffic. Folks have measured Highway 169 going north from 10 through Elk River is that all 87 counties every single day use that corridor. All 87 counties use Interstate 94 every day. And the volume of traffic is exceedingly heavy. Matter of fact, when they were doing some construction, they do that auxiliary lane uh, which they built to their usual specs, it broke down twice during that construction because the amount of usage and the, the commercial trucks and things like that broke down that auxiliary uh, there that was just during construction. They changed that the next time when they did that to make it much more sturdy so that they could get through a single construction period of time without having to redo it and shut everybody down. So it's a real challenge and... Um, I think the, one of the things when we did the corridors of commerce was that it be a metric driven, um, that it was, we appreciated that. And but I think some of the other proposals here have some merit as well. Look forward to hearing more about it. But I, I have a great deal of sympathy or empathy for those smaller towns and cities that are regional corridors as well. Um, but are still relatively much smaller projects than what you would see in districts like mine. Um, but I think remind, I think sometimes in our local folks of how much traffic of all Minnesota comes through our area, that is not necessarily the case in Bemidji or Grand Rapids or in Granite Falls and some of those places. You, you just kind of don't have that. It's just geographical location. And um, it, it took a lot um, to get to that point. 
So I really appreciate the effort that MnDOT is making here, and I know that we'll all give it careful consideration. I think it's been good that you are giving a little more time with that corridors of commerce to consider looking at these things before you start doing the projects. I also think the ATP is having a chance to weigh in and do some of that work also because they have a lot of knowledge about the overall general needs, but sometimes MnDOT, you're looking at things through a little different lens, um, has some possibilities. So I'll be talking to my local ATPs and counties and so on and see how they feel about this and the extra workload that it creates for them. It saves you and MnDOT some, but it's actually transferring the work down to um, the county and the area level. And, and I know that even uh, MnDOT, when they did scoping and did all kinds of work on uh, the projects that we had, our local um, county engineers, city engineers, all kinds of folks pitched in to assist MnDOT in laying those things out and doing that work. It's a, it's a, it takes a cooperative effort and appreciate that very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I might take a little bit different take on uh, on the ATP portion of this of this bill, Mr. Rudine. Um, so all projects would help me understand this. All projects would be scored by the tab, and the tab would send ten of those projects to the Metropolitan Council. Chisago County Board would evaluate their own projects, score them. They would send their top two, a top one plus a, a backup to the Metropolitan Council. And for the entire metropolitan area, eight county metropolitan area as defined by this, three projects would, would then be considered. And if I read this correctly, um, all projects not recommended for evaluation are disqualified from further consideration. So I've, I've heard some concern from the county on this particular provision, and I'm hoping that maybe you can talk a little bit more about why we would want to put so much uh, emphasis into the tab when even among the Met Council members, there's a belief that the tab is probably uh, overweighted um, to, the, to the inner core, particularly Hennepin County and Ramsey County, and then... Um, why we would have the Metropolitan Council basically disqualifying projects, because uh, many of us believe the Metropolitan Council, just by its very makeup, is more heavily weighted and influenced to the uh, to the inner core. Um, shy of, of my bill to reform the Met Council. So let's just say that that would be an improvement on this, but... Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit more about that part and, and have you been hearing concerns from counties or, or any of the local agencies that, that would be working on this? Mr. Rudine. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, uh, first I think it's important to clarify that um, the, the Met Council uh, would forward 10 projects for the metro area. So the, in greater Minnesota, the ATPs would each select three projects for their ATP, but in the metro area, we would have 10 projects plus uh, the Chisago County projects. Um, so it wouldn't uh, be limited to three in the metro area. Um, you know, there's, uh, we, we have had conversations with, you know, the county engineers and so forth in the metro area. And there is um, kind of an issue that where, you know, the, the projects that are on 494, for example, are gonna probably compete better just because they have higher traffic volumes than uh, some of the other uh, roads that sort of connect the metro area to greater Minnesota. And so, um, you know, there, there are a couple approaches that, that we could take. One would be to potentially also create a small projects category in the metropolitan area, as we're proposing to do for greater Minnesota. Um, another would be to uh, kind of modify the definition of regional balance so that um, some subset of the seven county metro area was defined as as urban you know you could use like the the federal census bureau urbanized area you could use the transit taxing district or you know some other approach to to say sort of the urban core 
is is one set of projects and and uh, projects within that area would compete against each other and then have like a collar sort of a Twin Cities collar counties or counter region or collar region that would compete against each other and then the greater Minnesota projects would compete against each other so that that's an approach that we've been discussing with um, uh, I think uh, some of the, the county engineers and so forth um, it's not currently in this proposal but but we're certainly open uh, to that approach if, if that uh, is something people would like to see Senator Pratt uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Rodine, thank you for that explanation. I, I, I can just, I think this is going to take a little more work. Um, I appreciate your feedback for me to consider and take back to the suburban counties that have raised concerns over this, uh, over this proposal. Seeing no further questions, we have one further testifier, Shane Zart. Please identify yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Senator Newman, for bringing this bill forward. And it's uh, very good to see Senator Jasinski by video here. Uh, and and uh, thanks for having me for my first in-person testimony since I think March 12th of 2020. So excited to be here. But um, also uh, grateful, and I, I think, uh, well, I've, I've, I should say, I'm Shane Zart with Flaherty and Hood and represent the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And as many members know, our firm also works with the Highway 14 Partnership. And uh, you know, both of those organizations have been active uh, participants and stakeholders in the corridors of commerce. And uh, uh, on Highway 14, we'll now soon be able to drive uh, between Rochester and, and New Ulm all the way on four lanes. Uh, thanks in large part to corridors of commerce, but um, Mr. Zark, could we stop saying 14, please? Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, well, that's, that one's for Senator Jasinski yeah, on the I line know. there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, so that's the last one, Mr. Chair. Uh, but you know, uh, excited to uh, to be here, and, and thanks first to to MnDOT because I, I think that you know what's reflected in this bill is a good faith effort to address some of the very real underlying problems with the current program. And frankly, it's lost uh, folks' trust. Uh, advocates, the department, legislators have, have uh, 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 the, the program, underlying program corridors of commerce has, has lost the trust of, of uh, the transportation community to accomplish the types of projects that we want to see it accomplish. And um, I want to say, you know, the, a couple things in there, you know, the ATPs, I think the exact structure is uh, open for more discussion, but uh, some measure of uh, uh, pre-screening or, or some entity that can narrow the list of projects. You know, right now, uh, one of the previous uh, speakers uh, had phrased it this way, MnDOT's required to score everything that gets submitted. Yeah, and that's just untenable, and, and so some kind of uh, uh, narrowing uh, uh, would be a huge benefit. Um, regional balance, obviously a huge component for our membership and the uh, greater Minnesota cities. Uh, but I think, you know, all of our member cities recognize, too, it's more complicated than just a 50-50 a split and writing that into law. And, uh, you know, the, although it wasn't in code, it was, that's the, the principle that was followed, I think, from 17 or 13 to 17 and from 17 onward, but with very different results. And so it's important that we get the underlying structure right. And I hope that we can do that this session with, with some funding uh, around the corner. Um, but want to also recognize the Small Projects Fund. Uh, I think that that's a good uh, idea worthy of discussion. There may be other ways to get at that, but I wanted to add something from uh, MnDOT. This is from uh, the agency's 2020 report on the Corridors of Commerce program. And just to put some numbers to the differences we've seen in the, the kind of two eras of the program. From 13 to 17, the legislature put uh, just over what, $331 million into the program, and that helped accomplish 27 projects. And in 17 and 18, $850 million, and that went to seven projects. And don't get me wrong, those seven projects were fantastic. One of them, Senator Jasinski drives on frequently. I'm not going to say the name of it. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but you can see the difference there where there's uh, a little bit of deciding, what do we want the program to be? Can it get to both projects big and small? Can we spread the money around? And I think use some of that investment to do things, very smaller investments, like design, right-of-way acquisition, the types of things that keep projects shovel-ready, so that if you're not in this round of selection, you might be more ready for the next one. Uh, so uh, this was alluded to, but the last thing I think I want to say briefly is that a lot of our members 
even if they're located in greater Minnesota, care deeply about some of those projects. Uh, 212 comes to mind. When we talk about the types of projects that might technically be located definitionally in this approach in the metro area, uh, but facilitates access uh, between greater Minnesota and the metro area. The city of Granite Falls has been mentioned a few times here, and I know I'll mention them again, because you'll find folks in Granite Falls are as passionate as anyone about uh, seeing 212 improved, because they drive it every day uh, that they want to come into the metro or come testify here at the Capitol or, or visit family or, or whatever it is. And I think that um, Mr. Rudine had mentioned uh, a couple other ways to look at the, those collar projects that are going to be left behind, I think, under the current structure, maybe under the structure in this bill, but with some work and some creative ideas, I think we can get to them too. So, uh, but thank you. Look forward to it. I know it's going to be laid over, so uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty more discussion about this one, and, and I'll leave it at that. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one of the areas I want to be uh, clear, though, when I say looks promising or looks interesting doesn't mean, oh, it's wonderful and I'm great and it's all good and wonderful. Okay, just so be clear on that. And somebody says they were, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, but that it has merit to have further discussion. One of the areas that I think, though, that I want to be sure uh, that we do take a look at is on page 321 and it's repeated elsewhere. And this is each ATP in the tab as well, possibly may develop its own process to determine which projects to recommend. That is too open, way, way, way too open. Uh, there's criteria um, in regards to the quarters of commerce. There is a list of criteria that they need to use, but the process is, I think, a little bit too vague and too open, and I think that can lead to a not good outcome because there's no... Uh, <clears throat> There's no outset here for what that process should include. It was just very, very, very open. And I think with the multiple ATPs we have and others, I think there ought to be a little bit more about the process itself. Do you want to respond, Mr. Zart? Or looks like Mr. Redeen wants one of you to. Uh, Mr. Mr. Redeen. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, I, I think yeah we can certainly try to come up with uh, some way to put some framework around that. I, I think our theory was you know that um, that one ATP might have something that's important in their local area that maybe doesn't apply in another part of the state, and so we wanted to provide them sort of the maximum flexibility. But uh, I, I get your point, and, and uh, I'll go back and. Uh, talk to uh, the program administrators uh, and see if we can come up with some um, suggestions for how we could put some framework around that. Senator Kiffmeyer. Any further questions? Seeing none. Senator, uh, Senator Newman, um, would you like to, I have a suggestion, I don't know if you want to add it to this bill, uh, we have a ban on the term Dan Patch, would you like to put a, an amendment on here to ban the number 14 just for fun today? or? Is there are a number of uh, matters that we will be undertaking as we work on this bill, and we will be working on the bill. Uh, we will take your suggestion under advisement. Uh, with, <laughs> with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, perhaps you could lay the bill over. Uh, Senator uh, <coughs> Newman lays over the uh, Senate file 3123 for possible future inclusion. Thank you, gentlemen. And for the record, Senator Jasinski did react, so he was paying attention. Last item on our agenda for this afternoon is a presentation of the Governor's Supplemental Budget Bill. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Anderson Keller is here. If you would come to the testifying table, please. Okay. 
Commissioner, if you'd identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to appear in person. It will be my last appearance before you, too. So I wanted to come to say thank you to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for all the work that you have done in transportation and all of your members as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, before I begin, I'm going to answer the question of the alternative fuel corridor issue that was asked earlier, whether that's broader than just uh, EV charging, and it is. The federal definition is uh, all fuels, EV charging, hydrogen, propane, CNG, and LNG. So all of those are eligible in that definition of a alternative fuel corridor. Well, again, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we're glad to appear before you and give you the uh, overview of the governor's supplemental budget proposal. We are also going to go over the policy, but you did that bill already, so we'll do that very quickly because it included all of those items. Um, many of you can, and I think that uh, Mr. Brown is with us, and he is going to share the slides at this point. I don't know if that's happening, though. There we go. All right. Uh, many of you can, by now, give this presentation, the beginning part of it, about our system. And first of all, we want to just start with our vision and our mission again. Uh, our vision is of the multimodal transportation system that maximizes the health of people, the environment, and our economy. And the mission is to plan, build, operate, and maintain a safe and accessible and efficient and reliable multimodal transportation system. Uh, that includes the connecting people to destinations and markets throughout the state. You, of course, have touched on many of those items today already in the bill presentations. We have the fourth largest system in the country. It has over 145,000 center lane miles. That includes both the state system and local roads and a little under 5,000 uh, bridges that are over the 10 foot in length on trunk highway routes. As well as pointing out to all of you that over 50% of our state highways and 35% of our bridges are more than 50 years old, which already puts them at risk in terms of their condition. Um, in uh, FY 21-22, over 156 construction projects and $21 billion in investments planned over the next 20 years. We also work to support our partners, the seven active public ports, three on Lake Superior, four um, in the Mississippi River system ports. There are a couple private ports out there as well. And then transit services in the 80 counties outside of the metropolitan area and 133 uh, publicly owned airports, as well as a little under 4,500 track miles for railroads. So I think to get into the meat of the presentation, uh, we looked at uh, how we prioritize funding in MnDOT around these three key priority areas, addressing uh, the need for a sustainable transportation system sufficient to keep the system in a good state of repair. Um, that gets to that MnDOT is a planning organization as well as uh, a construction uh, facilitator. And that planning work really uh, gets to a number of the items you'll see today. We also have a goal to promote equity in MnDOT in workforce and contracts including transportation planning and programming, and including uh, uh, finally looking at things through improved environmental stewardship, sustainability, and reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. And you heard a little bit about that uh, as well. I wanna just point out that uh, a number of our contracting work um, there's a lot of opportunity to expand equity and contracting, both for women contractors, people of color, other people who have traditionally not 
uh, done well in the highway heavy projects, such as rethinking I-94, the Twin Ports Interchange Project up in Duluth, as well as Blatnick Bridge. And in fact, we've had some success in Duluth where our district engineer, Dwayne Hill, has partnered with the Duluth Workforce Center and developing uh, cultural ambassadors to be able to talk about working uh, with MnDOT and with MnDOT contractors. And we'd like to continue on with that type of work. So the next slide is gonna show uh, the overall supplemental budget items. The change items here include uh, the multimodal transportation package overall, the maximizing the federal dollars in climate funding, which I'll talk about more in detail, as well as some compensation operating impacts, the quarters of commerce, project scoring that you just discussed, uh, armor radio towers, rail grade safety, and uh, utility aircraft replacement, which we refer to as pickups in the sky. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about those as well. So uh, next, we are tracking the performance of our system with a number of different performance measures. And we really prioritize the infrastructure improvements on the national highway system, the NHS routes, and hold those roads uh, and routes to a higher performance standard than the non-national highway system routes. This approach uh, really allows MnDOT to comply with federal law, and that's going to be important with the large federal infrastructure bill. Pavement condition is measured by the percent of miles uh, of highway in poor condition. And these three measures are without the federal bill investment. So the, uh, the condition of our roadway, if we did not have that investment and do not have the partnership with the, with the legislature this year, uh, we are predicted to worsen on our national highway system pavement conditions. Uh, after 2020 and the bridge condition as well as projected to significantly decline um, uh, into poor condition by 2031. So next, the federal bill, uh, we at MnDOT prefer to refer to it as the IIJA, the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. Uh, versus there's another way people refer to it as bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law, they're interchangeable terms, same bill. And this is going to bring $4.8 billion over five years into the federal highway formula system for roads and bridges. That represents from MnDOT a 30% increase into the state's highway formula funding. There's also a 20% increase into uh, the existing core programs, plus some new programs that have been defined in the bill. And uh, the new expanded competitive grant programming, which includes things like bridge investment program for nationally significant bridges, the raise and infra grants, which many of you are familiar with, some of those have been uh, awarded in your legislative districts in the past, there were some updates to those. The Safe Streets to, for All program, there's Federal Transit Administration grants, there's FAA grants for airports, and there's Port and Railway Infrastructure grants. All of those are either expanded or new programs. If we go to the next slide, we're going to show you uh, in rough estimates what's coming to Minnesota per year. So. Through the Federal Highway Administration, MnDOT will receive $170 million a year. We must match that money, 20%. That comes in through the formula. The Federal Highway Administration also has funding for local units of government. That's $70 million a year, and that needs to be matched as well, 20%. Federal, uh, the FAA is the airport's money. $35 million of that 60 million will go to the Metropolitan to MSP. Um, MnDOT does not oversee MSP as you all know, but important to point out the rest, the bulk of that goes to the other publicly owned airports then. That has a lower match amount at 10%. 
And the FTA, this is the MnDOT portion only. So that's the 80 counties outside of the metropolitan area, $13 million a year to those transit uh, providers with actually a little higher match there of 36% a year. The discretionary programs, MnDOT has done some work to look at what is the historic uh, way that we participate in those discretionary programs. We have typically uh, received about 2% and should receive about 2% based on population and other factors. If that is calculated out, that's about $450 million a year and most of it needs to be matched. And so that is where we have calculated a discretionary match money at $112 million a year. I point this out because when we apply for discretionary funding, one of the most important factors in applying for that money is that a project is, uh, has more than 50% of its money identified. And so this pot of money should, uh, working with the legislature, should this be appropriated, it will allow for us to put forward the most competitive grants from the get-go. And I think that's very important to be able to bring back to Minnesota federal dollars that your constituents all pay. And so being able to bring those dollars back in one of the ideas here is to set up that match fund from, from the start so that we can be able to both work with local partners and other project proposers to make competitive applications, whether it's through infra, raise, the bridge program, any of those programs. The next slide uh, is the five-year number. So that is dedicating $852 million a year uh, to various transportation investments over five years. So this includes $384 million uh, towards the Trunk Highway Fund, uh, largely that will provide the match for the federal dollars, $268 million for local roads and bridges on the county and the municipal system, and then $200 million general fund match for activities off of the Trunk Highway system. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, the budget authority is necessary for us to be able to spend the federal dollars. Uh, if we don't have the budget authority from the legislature, we will not be able to access the federal dollars. And they do expire on the federal calendar year. They will roll to potentially available to other states. And so we, we do need to work together as a partnership to get that done. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. And uh, this is the overall multimodal transportation package summary spending by year. We're gonna move on and talk about some very specific things next. Um, it, many of you have uh, already heard from the State Patrol and DPS that in 2021, the preliminary count on fatalities on roadways in Minnesota was 499 people who lost their life. That is the highest in decades. And in fact, by our own plans, we should be more on a trajectory to not lose more than 225 lives by 2025. You can see there's a huge gap there. And this is uh, one of the biggest priorities out of the federal bill is safety. So investments in safety on our national highway system, as well as working with our other partners on the Towards Zero Deaths program, the Highway Patrol, as well as public health related items um, are going to be important. Meeting the match uh, federally is going to be very important here to access these safety dollars. The next slide, uh, will also uh, highlight the important piece of when you're talking about quarters of commerce, a lot of the focus in the federal bill is also on commerce and mobility. Uh, these pictures show you both the current operation of Twin Ports Interchange. Uh, Senator McCune also knows it by its, uh, 
its uh, name in Duluth called the Can of Worms. And that is being worked on right now. It's the preliminary project ahead of the Blatnick Bridge. And you can see that large turbine coming up the hill in Duluth. Right now, one of the problems uh, for the port is the access coming out of the port of Duluth and the type of turns that uh, particularly truck traffic has to take um, is challenging for a number of these loads. So uh, we really wanna make sure that those types of trips are on our highway system, not on the local system. And right now, many of them are taking place on the local system because these trucks cannot uh, make the turns out of the port onto the bridge or into uh, the rest of the system. Next slide will show you what we are dealing with. You heard a little bit about the Highway 67 uh, redesignation. This uh, is actually the Highway 210 that was washed out near J. Cook State Park, and that has since been repaired. But with more intense rain events in Minnesota, we are seeing more of these types of uh, adverse effects, often because culverts are undersized. So a big part of climate resiliency is being able to place in larger culverts to handle the water, uh, to make the bridges stronger, a little bit higher. Those are part of the climate resiliency portion of this IIJA. There's other parts of it too, like the uh, EV charging dollars that are gonna come to the state through formula to help build out a network of EV chargers. But very important that we are building um, more resilient uh, roadways as well. Uh, the next slide will show you a little bit about uh, what the, what the agency itself faces, and that's compensation and operating impacts. Uh, MnDOT actually is uh, usually a little less competitive for folks who are in the maintenance and operations area and the snow fighting area than your counties and cities. And one way to keep us competitive is to make sure that we can pay our labor costs uh, we already will be uh, absorbing a portion of this labor cost, but are asking for an increase, uh, a base increase of 3.5 million in 22, and an additional 20.4 million in the years after that. Uh, the, the challenge is, and you can see these two pictures, it's challenging work. Uh, a lot of our crews are out at night, they are in, uh, dangerous situations, frankly, uh, with especially with the speed of drivers nowadays. And we do do a lot of our repair work in the evenings to be able to keep free flow of traffic during the daytime hours. We also, uh, you can see the snow fighters out there. They love their jobs, but we also wanna make sure we can keep them on the job. They have very specialized knowledge of their routes and it's important for us to be able to cover these increases, both insurance and salary increases. Uh, we're gonna go, this is a more detailed breakdown of that. And as you can see, the two largest areas in the compensating operating impacts are in operations and maintenance. That is your snow fighting. That is the folks who are out fixing the guardrails, uh, doing a number of those activities and then the program delivery side. And that is where we are doing the planning to make sure we can deliver the projects to your constituents. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide and we'll go very fast here. This is revising the quarters of commerce language. You just had a discussion about this. I don't need to talk about it too much. You had a great discussion and I appreciated hearing it. I'm sure there's going to be a way to work on these issues of regional balance, uh, something for the small projects category. Um, the next slide we'll go through is the Armor Radio Communications. This $2 million is to rebuild about two or three of the critical infrastructure towers. 
Uh, these towers were built either in the 50s or 60s that we'll be replacing. This is very important to law enforcement and being able to have that communications across the state. The next slide is the uh, rail grade safety account. And here we're asking for an increase from $1 million to $2.5 million a year. This is, uh, this is to the point of rail grades crossings at trunk highways. And so a real safety issue to be able to upgrade those to reduce the conflicts between vehicles and rail traffic. Next slide are our pickup trucks in the sky. This is $7 million for two airplanes. This is not the airplane that the governor or anyone else uses. This is utility pickup uh, pickups that basically take MnDOT staff to the publicly owned airports. If there's an equipment failure, they get out there and they help the airport replace that. They also do inspections. They also can access the, the um, uh, sea bases uh, or uh, water-based uh, locations. Beechcraft, this is a Beechcraft Bonanza 14 uh, and 16. They're both due for replacement. I hate to tell you, but one of them actually is existing with a lot of duct tape on it. And I hope that you can find a way to replace this. I think it's a basic risk and safety issue for folks. Um, policy proposals, you heard Senator Newman's bill already. I'm not gonna read this to you, but it's all the items. I think there's two slides of this that are the items in the policy bill and uh, folks look forward to working with you. So that's the presentation, Mr. Chairman. Member questions for the commissioner. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if somebody else has a question. I don't want to have to be the... Well, you're the first one I saw, so go ahead. Well, okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, I remember the, the first time you came to the committee, so uh, you're moving on, and we appreciate uh, the work that you do. The um, question I have for you is, um, usually when you have a match, you have a match, and if you, if you provide the match, then you get the money. So I'm quite puzzled here about how you're talking about how a match would make you more competitive. That doesn't kind of fit with a standard way of if you have the match, you get the money. So what's going on here that a match would make us more competitive? Commissioner. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Kif Kifmeyer, it's such a great question. So in these competitive programs that either USDOT runs or the Federal Highway Administration runs, where we have to compete with every other state in the country submitting a proposal forward. The idea and what I have observed over my three years as commissioner, when a project like the 94 gap project comes forward and we have not been able to fully uh, fill the portion of the gap that would need to come from Minnesota, then the feds look at that and they say, maybe not as strong as proposal. Where are they gonna get that money from? We might have to take it from another project in another district. We might have to take it from 212 or somewhere else. And then we it's have to, sorry, to. now those are fighting words, aren't they, Mr. Chair? But that is the kind of situations that MnDOT is often put into when we are competing for a grant where we have to supply a, a good portion of the money and the, get, the idea is that those federal dollars would close the gap. And so as a way to do that, having a ready available amount of money as we apply, we can point to that money then and say, should we be successful in being able to get that money to close the gap on 94, we can promise you federal government that we're gonna be able to deliver this project within a couple of years. And the challenge is without some pool of money to do that, we then start moving money around from other projects around the state or within the region. And you know that's a fairness question for your constituents, whether that's a good way to go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Johnson-Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Commissioner. I wish I was there, although I'm sure I will see you in your next role uh, as we continue to be transportation advocates. Uh, I have just a few comments. First, in regards to the um, governor's proposal for $2.5 million in rail crossings, I just want to emphasize for those um, of my colleagues who are from rural areas, this is a huge need out in rural Minnesota. Uh, as you know, I deal much with local governments and for them to have to cover the costs, even the local share for these uh, trunk highway and frankly county road rail crossings is very significant. Uh, the railroad is difficult to deal with in many cases, uh, just from a cost share perspective. And so I just wanna emphasize that specifically I mean, there's a lot for rural Minnesota in the governor's proposal, but I also um, just around that rail is, issue is, is significant and I wanted to highlight that. Uh, secondly, I'm a little freaked out when you mentioned the beach craft. <laughs> uh, I have flown in that airplane many a times and so I want to emphasize uh, the fact that it gets used appropriately. Uh, your air, aeronautics division does a great job and uh, I would very much uh, advocate for the replacement of that aircraft. And then second, or thirdly, I just want to say uh, to the commissioner directly how much we have enjoyed working with you, how much uh, professionalism and streamlining I have witnessed come to MnDOT under your leadership. Uh, I have seen um, historically excluded uh, people be lifted and given business opportunities. I have participated in many quality improvements. I've seen your engineers be thoughtful and innovative around um, new ways to design and context sensitivity and ways to enhance communities. I have seen just constant improvements in the last a uh, few years under your tenure, and I, I think you've done a great job, and I wish you well at your next uh, uh, at your next job. So that's all I have. Thank you. Questions from members? I am not seeing any further questions. Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, uh, give MnDOT a heads up that I will be sending a letter to MnDOT requesting uh, a detailed explanation of all of the money that is proposed to be being spent in the governor's supplemental budget bill and uh, and uh, to the point where I, re I really want to know exactly what it is that the money is going to be spent on. With that, uh, we have completed our agenda and we are adjourned. Thank you.